Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Wendy Alexander. I'm the Vice Principal International, and I am absolutely delighted to welcome you to the first of the university's Africa lecture series. And so tonight, hot foot from COP27 in Sharm el Sheikh, uh, we are delighted to welcome Professor Sostin Chiota. Thank you. Chiota is an expert uh, in climate change and international leadership on ecosystem services and poverty alleviation in lower income countries. And as we came in this evening, I took the precaution of asking Sostin how I pronounced his surname, uh, Chiota, correctly. And he revealed that the name means biomass which I just think shows the extraordinary prescience of Malawian mothers to half a century ago realise what our son's destiny was going to be. We are envious. Anyway, my only task for this evening is now to uh, introduce our Principal and Vice-Chancellor Ian Gillespie, who, as many here will know, has been the driving force both behind the university's new strategy, but also its key focus on Africa. So, Principal and Vice-Chancellor, over to you to introduce the evening. Thank you. Well, thank you, Wendy, but uh, uh, I can absolutely assure you that everything we do is strategy, Africa, international, here at home is very much team sports, and uh, uh, every one of us is one way or another uh, involved in that team sport. Um, Sosten, what a pleasure and a privilege to welcome you. Sosten and I have known each other for a few years. Um, we are at the beginnings of what's going to be an even longer relationship, Sosten, because you do realise that once we've had you here in Dundee, there will be no escape for you. Um, and uh, actually, not only is Sosten's name about using biomass, but of course, today is Biodiversity Day. So COP27, Sharm el Sheikh, uh, talk about this as being biodiversity. They, I mention this for three reasons. One, because biodiversity and biomass go so much hand in hand, and so much of the work that, that Sosten's done is around biodiversity, uh, is around maintaining biodiversity, the role of biodiversity in uh, sustainable ecosystems and in poverty alleviation and back again. Uh, and when I had the pleasure of visiting Sosten's work in Lake Chowa uh, over the summer, uh, we spoke a lot about shifts in biodiversity because bio, uh, biomass is great, biodiversity is even better, Sosten. So um, Sosten, biodiversity, biomass is going to be your, your, your name. I don't know how quite you translate that. Um, the biodiversity thing uh, is, of course, very meaningful because the Biodiversity Convention was signed, what, 30 years ago? And uh, that makes me feel quite old because I was, um, uh, as a, a, a young gish scientist in the then Department of Environment, part of the uh, UK government's negotiating team for the Biodiversity Convention. And uh, as Sosa and I were walking around uh, Lake Chilwa, um, uh, our, our commentary was actually what we saw there was in line with the Biodiversity Convention, uh, but actually uh, biodiversity and ecosystem services were nevertheless under real threat. So there's a lesson there, which is conventions are great framework things, but it's what people do that really makes a difference. And what people do is what Sosten has been around uh, throughout his career both as an academic, but particularly as, as a leader in uh, fronting up a project which was probably the best project in a very significant UK funded uh, programme, which spent £45 million on something called Ecosystem Services for Poverty Alleviation. And it was my good friend Paul Van Garding who sat in the front here, who was the director of uh, that project. And whenever I'd say to him, I, I at one time was one of the funders of it. Whenever I said to him, what's your best project, Paul? It was always Sosten's that he uh, mentioned. And that is because Sosten really connected with 
the people in Malawi, uh, the communities, the communities that were eroding the environment, the, the communities that were harvesting from the environment, the communities that were sustaining the environment. And so that kind of circular economy, circular system of sustainability, Sustan has been and remains a real pioneer in a low income country, in a country where ecosystem services make a difference between life and death. Of course, COP27 is uh, going on now. Um, it's picking up on what was uh, a fantastic COP26 in Glasgow. Lots of commitments made, and these commitments need to be turned into action. And again, Sustan and his team are at the leading edge of that action in Southern and uh, Eastern Africa. And he's going to tell us a fair amount about that now. So, Hearing from Sostin, hearing from Malawi experience, I think is uh, very exciting, very enlightening. For us in the University of Dundee, uh, well, we were a part of uh, uh, the project that Sostin led under Ecosystem Services for Poverty Alleviation. But we also as a university have had long-standing uh, relationships uh, with Malawi across areas, dentistry, uh, mineral law, uh, around uh, uh, medicine, uh, uh, kids, so a whole range of activities and uh, building a stronger link with Malawi through something called the Blantar Declaration, which is bringing together public universities on how we work together in equitable partnerships. And something again, that Sustin helped us land in Malawi as the beginnings of our Africa initiative uh, earlier this year. And we'll be recognising Sostin with uh, an honorary degree from the University of Dundee. It's the highest honour we can bestow on, on our colleagues uh, later this week. And uh, much deserved it is to Sostin. But tonight, um, well, as part of a, a, an Africa initiative and and building on that commitment to more sustainable partnerships, more equitable partnerships, in taking forward our strategy around population health and wealth, uh, around uh, climate action and delivering a net zero, and equity and inclusion. Uh, Africa, uh, all countries in Africa, partners in Africa, are, key, are key uh, partners in delivery of our objectives around the equity and inclusion piece. So our Africa initiative is about reaching out and partnering with uh, institutions, with individuals across Africa to deliver on, on that broader strategy. And our Africa lecture series will be um, picking up uh, with esteemed colleagues across the continent, beginning with Sostin, to celebrate that partnership. Last thing for me to say tonight, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is that um, we are joined online by uh, quite a number of uh, colleagues. Uh, both here in the UK and in Malawi. Um, although we can't see people, I just want to uh, recognise, uh, well, well, two anyway. Um, one is uh, His Excellency Dr Thomas Besika. Uh, Thomas is the um, uh, High Commissioner for Malawi. He had intended to be with us. Uh, I think you were classmates together, uh, Sostan, so he, he will miss not being here in person to see you, but uh, 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 Your Excellency Thomas, welcome. Uh, can I also recognise uh, one of the individuals who really helped us set up the whole of our Africa initiative, who is the uh, uh, Honourable Nancy Temple, who is Malawi's Minister for Foreign Affairs. And uh, Nancy, when she was here at COP26 last year, was a real champion of creating the Blantyre Declaration. Uh, and I'm not sure if Nancy is able to join us or not, but I'm sure she'll pick this up on uh, recording. So Nancy, once again, uh, from all of us in Dundee, a very big thank you. So that's it for me. Um, let me turn over to the main act. Uh, Sostan is going to talk to us about building community and ecosystem resilience to climate change. Lessons from Lake Chowa Basin. Sostan, what an honour. Floor is yours. Thank you, Ian. It's a um, great honor for the University of Dundee uh, to invite me to come to your uh, important university, a well-known uh, university, not just in the UK, 
uh, but globally. And therefore, I do not take the invitation uh, for granted. And um, Paul, thank you very much for the journey that we have moved together for a long time. Um, yeah, so my name is uh, actually uh, Sustainable Use of Biomass or Energy. And so people are actually saying I should change my first name to Sustainable Water because then it will complete this, the story of sustainable use of, uh, uh, of biomass. Uh, it's also been a privilege uh, to meet the son of one of our professors at the University of Malawi. Uh, the professor set up the geography department uh, at the Chancellor College, and uh, it's a small world. Uh, I met him here, uh, but also David Bond was one of the lecturers at the University of Malawi. I also met him here. So I'm actually home, away from home. And uh, thank you very much. So let's go into uh, the, uh, the, the presentation. Um, so I begin by talking about uh, the African lake and uh, river basins and opportunities and challenges. Uh, because we know they are principal sources of livelihoods uh, for many communities and significantly contribute uh, to the continent's uh, socioeconomic development. However, uh, the basins are experiencing rapid uh, changes due to human activities resulting in altered ecosystems, uh, but also climate change is um, uh, creating uh, challenges. And um, so we say that climate change makes the situation that is already worse and the proverb in Malawi, Bavunda Kola, meaning that uh, when the hyenas in those days would come and steal uh, goats, they would actually inspect the livestock shelter to see the weak point. And that's exactly what is happening uh, with uh, uh, climate change. This concern uh, is shared by high level uh, uh, political leadership. For example, the African uh, Minister's Council on water uh, at the Pan-African Implementation and Partnership Conference highlighted increasing trends of these water-related threats and vulnerabilities on African river and lake basins. And similarly, they faced the United Nations Water Development Report highlighted issues globally, but specifically uh, for Africa. So with this, there's need for long-term integrated uh, management programs. Um, for example, a high-level African ministerial dialogue on the management of lake basins for their sustainable use. This was in Nairobi in 2005. So they, they, they proposed for making uh, integrated management of lake basins uh, a long-term element of, of governments requiring uh, financing. But also, we realize that uh, SADC, this is Southern African Development Community, um, much stakeholder uh, dialogue uh, actually recommended that one of the integrated approaches would be the water, energy, and food uh, nexus approach. And this was recommended to the SADC Council. So, we are talking about uh, Lecture Basin, for those who don't know where it is, uh, that's where uh, Malawi is, and that's where um, uh, Lake Shura Basin is. Lake Shura is actually the second uh, largest lake in Malawi, and it's the most uh, productive lake because of its uh, shallowness. There's quite a lot of um, nutrient uh, recycling. So what is the significance of uh, Lake Shura uh, Basin? to the riparian communities. It supports livelihood of uh, in excess of 1.5 uh, uh, million people through agriculture, fishery, and other uh, natural resource-based uh, goods and services. Uh, fishery alone contributes up to 18 million US dollars uh, in a year, so it's quite uh, significant. And, and the basin also provides surface and underground water for irrigation, and portable water supply. Um, it also supports a vibrant uh, lake uh, transport uh, system. 
International significance of the lake is that it is the Ramza site uh, because it is habitat for many birds that come from Europe, Africa itself, and, and then some from within the country. And it is also a UNESCO uh, Man and Biosphere uh, Reserve. Other ma Man and Biosphere Reserve sites in Malawi, uh, Mulanje uh, Mountain. And today we planted the Mulanje cedar uh, in the University Botanical Garden, um, which the native of Mulanje cedar is actually uh, Mulanje Mountain. So the basin is divided in four zones. Zone one is actually the lake and uh, the wetland. And that is important for uh, fishing. Uh, but you also have um, uh, beds, as I mentioned earlier, uh, plus uh, floating huts. There are these floating huts which are called Zimboera. People go and uh, stay in these floating huts for up to a month, sometimes three months. And when they have caught enough fish, uh, then they can uh, uh, go back home. Uh, zone two is uh, a flood plain interfacing wetland and, 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 and the water. And that is important for irrigation. As you can see, rice irrigation is quite uh, big there, but also the bed sanctuaries uh, are there. Zone three is a midi watershed. This is where you have most of the human uh, settlements uh, in the basin, uh, but also much of the agriculture that is taking place there. And you will see that uh, <clears throat> there is the estate um, uh, farming, uh, which is more organized, but you also have um, uh, farms by small uh, holder uh, farmers. And, and then, of course, uh, zone uh, four is the escarpment, uh, which is the Zomba Plateau, up to 2,000 meters above sea level. This is where you have the main catchment and forest plantations, as well as the water reservoirs. The, the, the work that we have done um, in the uh, basin, uh, which was for seven years, um, it was a basin-wide intervention for the three districts, uh, Zomba, Machinga, and Palombe. And this was planned to respond to the 1996 complete drying of the lake, uh, where stakeholders had recommended a management plan. And we used the ecosystems approach. Um, and this ecosystems approach is not just relevant to uh, Malawi, but uh, uh, throughout uh, Africa. And the ecosystems approach, originally you had 10 principles which were defined in 1995 by the Convention on Biological uh, Diversity, but it remained a vague uh, concept as acknowledged at COP4. And um, the uh, CBD's subsidiary body on scientific, technical and technological advice was tasked, tasked to develop clear principles. And this meeting took place in Malawi, where 12 principles were developed. And that's why the ecosystems approach principles are also called uh, Malawi uh, principles. Now, we did quite a number of um, activities. Um, in lecture, the loss to fish uh, can be up to 40 percent because um, they uh, dry them in the open uh, in, in the open air and uh, also sometimes when it's raining it takes long for the fish to dry and also you have a lot of uh, flies and so they actually uh, go back and so and, and then we found that um, women are not participating fully in this lucrative uh, business so what we decided was to actually uh, engage women train them provide them with the technology so that they can compete effectively. And so we had the solar uh, dryers and the fish would dry within a day, no dust, no flies. And um, we also introduced the, uh, a smoking kiln where you would use less firewood by having several trays uh, of the fish at the same time. And um, then we also trained them to actually package the fish so that they can sell. So. Originally, they were getting 5,000 kwacha per kilo. After processing it in this way, they were getting 3,000 kwacha. And so 
it was a significant uh, uh, improvement. And um, those are the shelters that we uh, are produced. And um, the Vice Chancellor actually visited this place in, in August. Eh? Yes, and, 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 and with Paul. Now, because they were making so much money, uh, we talked to the uh, bank uh, to see if they could uh, support these communities. So they came and did their research and, and they found, yes, there's a lot of money uh, being made by these women. And so they established uh, mobile banking uh, uh, units. And that was the first time for the women to have a bank account for the first time to have uh, um, uh, 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 ATM cards. And, and so we were quite happy. But then of course, the lake dried. And uh, so when you see the sheds on the side, this is because after the lake dried in 2012, 2013, it dried again in 2018, uh, then the lucrative business that we had trained women in uh, uh, collapsed and they've never recovered. This is the face of, uh, of, of, of climate change. The other things that we did were crop diversification, linking uh, farmer groups to better markets, uh, because when they sell to vendors, they sell at a very low price. But when we engage the private sector, and uh, then they would agree uh, on how much they will uh, pay uh, for the commodity for the following year. And it was usually very, uh, very, very profitable. And, and so we're happy with that. Uh, but also diversification, uh, including growing chili. And actually they found out that per unit earlier, they made more money from chili than uh, uh, growing, uh, uh, growing maize. Uh, but also one of the challenges in the basin is that of soil erosion. And therefore we encouraged them to grow um, crops that improve soil cover, also improve uh, soil fertility, and also uh, had better income. And so like there, uh, we have the pigeon uh, peas. But also whenever there are extreme events such as floods or drought, uh, because the problem in Malawi is we have a single rainy season. And uh, if the rainfall starts late or it stops halfway, then your crop is not going to mature. And for that, we have given them uh, uh, drought tolerant crops so that uh, they can still harvest uh, something uh, uh, using uh, these crops. The other thing that we did was the forestation, rehabilitating river banks and uh, various um, uh, uh, hills that were degraded. And uh, the problem of short term projects is that you tend to be careful on what kind of indicators you would like to uh, put for your project. So for us, we had said that the uh, number of trees planted was a sign of success. Survival was uh, a sign of, of, of success. And that's what we had planned. But then by the year five, the community said, hey, come and see what has happened. This river had stopped flowing some 20 years ago, but since we started these interventions, the river is flowing. So we need to uh, do irrigation. We also needed to do uh, fish farming. And that means that uh, projects that involve ecosystem restoration need to actually take uh, a, a long time. So there is um, a picture of uh, the sign of the bank. Uh, Banki Abuera, meaning the bank is here. And uh, so they put the hours there. So the mobile bank uh, used to come. But as I said, when the lake dried, then there was no more money being made and, and, and the bank has actually closed. The other thing we did was uh, to improve communication and outreach uh, because um, climate change, uh, people did not understand, they did not appreciate. And um, I was talking to Paul and Ian uh, that among the people receiving the honorary degree, there's a story related to witchcraft. And in Malawi, 
whenever rainfall delayed, they said somebody was responsible. And um, usually it would be women, it would be elderly uh, 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 women. So we felt we needed to address that issue and, 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 and also with a, um, a strategy of communication and outreach. So we developed what we call the radio listeners clubs. Uh, recording is very easy these days with the digital uh, technology. You give them something to record, they record their programs and we air them on the radio and people love to listen to their voices on the radio and there was exchange from farmer uh, uh, to, to farmer. And then we also uh, set up uh, a community radio. Again, because projects are short term, uh, we didn't want to be landed with the radio after five years when the project has ended. So we entered into an agreement with the university because the university had always wanted it to have its own uh, community radio. Uh, but they were not able to justify it very easily. When we said this is climate change and environment, uh, then the authorities granted us the license very quickly. And um, so at the end of the project, the university has continued to uh, manage that. So that's what we do to improve uh, uh, literacy because the problem that farmers have is when and what to plant. And if you see uh, that picture, there's one farmer who has planted uh, on the right and on the left, another farmer has not planted. When we asked them, he said, uh, I think this is the first rain, this is the onset. The other one said, I don't think this is the right rain to plant. Because if you make a mistake, you actually lose your crop. And then you have to plant again. So you will have lost money uh, if you bought seed. So we felt that um, we need to actually uh, increase and upgrade weather monitoring stations. When we did the research, we found that most of them were dilapidated and in disuse. And um, thanks to Paul and Ian, when I said I need uh, scientific toys for uh, measuring uh, climate, uh, they agreed. And so we bought seven automated weather stations, which we uh, installed. The result is that uh, we are able to see what is happening and we can tell uh, the, 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 the farmers. So for example, in 2014 to 2015, um, the first rainfall came on 11 uh, November and it's only 3.2 millimeters. According to the Minister of Agriculture, you should have at least uh, 25 to 30 uh, for you to plant. So we told them, no, don't plant. It's only 3.2. The next one was 5.2. We told them uh, to not plant. Then the next one, which was in December, uh, then that was the right amount. And we told them, now you can plant. And um, it is important because you also connect with the forecast from the uh, MET station. They give you whether you're going to have rainfall in the next five days or in the next 10 days. So with the data that we're collecting in the communities and the forecast, we are able to provide the farmers with the right kind uh, uh, of information. But we're talking about climate change here that uh, keeps on shifting the goalposts. And so the following year, that's what happened. Um, the early in October, we had enough water according to the guidelines from the Minister of Agriculture to plant. And then four days later, it was also followed by high amount of rainfall. And we told them, do not plant because the forecast from the Met uh, was that uh, after this, there is going to be a long period without uh, any rainfall. But others ignored us. They said, no, this is enough rainfall they planted. And then you see the picture on the right. That's what happened, they had to uproot. So this is different from the earlier picture. And that's what we are uh, uh, experiencing. It keeps on changing every season. And um, because of the problems of um, unliable rainfall, uh, many farmers have gone into uh, irrigation. But you can also see that uh, it becomes so extensive and intensive that uh, uh, this is actually the river that should be supplying water to the lake. 
but you can see the whole of it has been uh, uh, cultivated and the uh, chances of um, if you have less rainfall, it means evaporation will be very high and, and therefore the lake is going to be deprived of, um, of water. So they still need for research. What is the optimal uh, arrangements that can be made for all the stakeholders in terms of uh, water use? 2018, uh, the lake dried again. And uh, you can actually see climate change and the gender dimension uh, because it was the women and the youth that providing water to, to livestock. When it dried in 1996, it was the same. Uh, the men operate boats because there's a lot of money being made. The men do the fishing. There's money to be made. When the lake dried, it's actually the women and the youth that have to carry uh, things on their heads. So you can understand why in the area strategy we targeted uh, uh, women uh, is because we see that uh, they tend to be affected more seriously. So if you look at the map of southern Malawi, uh, when the lake dried, uh, we mapped the migration. Some went to Blantyre City, others went to Zomba uh, town, others went to uh, Lake Malawi where the fishing was still going on or Lake Malombe where the fishing was going on. But women stayed at home. They had to look after their children, look after the elderly. And uh, so you can actually see that uh, uh, in terms of climate change, it doesn't affect uh, everyone uh, equally. Now, we had gauged the lake so that we should be monitoring uh, the amount uh, uh, of water. So if you look on the left at the top, that's the gauge that we had put, advised by the uh, expert uh, hydrologists, expert uh, flood modeling, uh, in, in flood modeling. And uh, so we installed that gauge in 2012. And so we're recording uh, the fluctuations goes up during the rainy season, goes down, uh, but at least we were able to take the readings. Then uh, came 2015, there was intense rains, and uh, that's the picture which is on the left at the bottom. The gauge was completely submerged. And uh, so we had no readings. And so when we talked to the water experts, they said, oh, quickly go there and uh, uh, do something. So they asked us to put a peg as far as the water line you can find and, 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 and the height. And uh, they said that then they could extrapolate through a tangent uh, to see uh, if we had a tall enough gauge what it would have recorded. And so that's why you are able to see there's white, that white uh, marker. Then we said, okay, let's revise uh, then the gauging arrangement. So we put uh, a new gauge uh, the, where the water had flooded. And then the following year, the lake dried. And, and so you can actually see that the gauge is exposed completely. And uh, this new gauge that we have installed, it is never read anything. And um, so that's what climate change is 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 behaving. That's its behavior. It's always uh, it's always uh, changing. Um, on the new gauge that we installed, you see a lot of plastics. So that's another thing. There's quite a lot of problems of uh, uh, plastics uh, in the water. Then uh, in 2015, uh, rice rice growing in Malawi, you need water, and and rice is grown. In, in, in water. And what happens is the women, the farmers, uh, prepare the land in an area where they know it's going to be flooded. And most of the years, there is the right amount of uh, water to grow the rice. But 2015 came, too much water that even rice could not uh, survive in that kind of water. And these are the problems that the farmers are dealing with with the, under the cases of uh, climate change. 
That's why I decided to put that picture. You know, feeding helpless from drying of the lake, sure. loss of livelihoods. Uh, this man um, was actually hiring out his boat uh, for fishermen or for transport. And um, when the lake dried, it means uh, all that had gone. Uh, but also, once the boat is exposed after the water has dried, you can't use it again. And um, so at COP27, they're talking about loss and damage. Could this be one candidate for loss and damage? The equipment that I got from Paul and Ian has helped us to characterize uh, what is happening. So uh, on the escarpment that I gave, uh, there is a, a dam which supplies water for the city. And in 1992, it had dried, so the university had to close uh, because there's no water, so the students uh, were sent home. And um, so in December last year, we thought the same thing was going to happen because we had only received 35 millimeters uh, of rainfall in, in, in Zomba Plateau. Then came January, um, the plateau received 406 millimeters in 24 hours. And the dam uh, was completely filled. Lower down in the city, uh, we received 210 uh, millimeters. But looking at these, you can actually see that much of the rain uh, at the um, plateau actually happened within two hours. So the intensity was very high. And the projections for climate change is that we will be having rains that are more intense. And using this equipment, using this analysis, we are able to actually uh, show that most of the rainfall came within uh, uh, two hours. But then something else we can also learn from this, uh, because that's the, the Mulungus Dam, which in December was very low. We were worried that um, uh, we would run out of water. But then the tropical storm dumped all that water and the dam filled. Now we are saying if that amount of water had fallen in another river basin, it would have caused flooding. So you can actually see that engineering can help to reduce vulnerability to flooding, uh, but also having uh, a, 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 an ecosystem in good shape will also uh, help. So we have those um, two rivers. The first one is Likangala. The next one is um, uh, uh, Mulunguzi. So the dam is on the Mulunguzi River. It has never flooded because it has got a good catchment. But the river on the left floods very frequently because of over cultivation uh, in the catchment. Then, of course, um, one day I was sitting in my office and I saw the wind speed uh, just start moving uh, very fast. And, and, and then suddenly we started seeing uh, iron sheets um, circulating and, and spinning. And um, that was the first record of um, tornado in Malawi. And after we had characterized that, then we put it on radio. Has anybody experienced this kind of uh, uh, event? And then we found that in Lilongwe, there was a community that had actually uh, experienced uh, a tornado. So we think tornadoes are an emerging issue in Malawi. We don't think it's just uh, an issue of improved uh, monitoring. Because when you look in South Africa, where they have monitored tornadoes from 1905, there's actually uh, an increase. So. I think that is what is happening. So having instrumentation helps for you to understand what is happening, to be able to explain. For example, when I made, uh, I presented this to the engineers, uh, they actually said at uh, 70 kilometers per hour, uh, a house that has been constructed very well should not have its roof uh, blown off, but quite a number of um, government buildings, including the, uh, the, 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 the 
the, the judiciary uh, had its roof washed off and, and, and uh, documents from the court were uh, actually uh, damaged. Um, and, and so my colleague was saying, we always talk about climate change affecting agriculture, affecting health, but we don't talk about climate change affecting the judiciary. But this uh, was uh, an example. Um, sometimes there are unintended consequences because of um, the repeated drying of the lake, um, the fish are not being given time to recover. And so there is a program of a good program supplying mosquito nets to prevent malaria. And then we discovered that those mosquito nets actually are being turned into fishing gear. And when you do that, it means you are catching everything. And so the vicious cycle of uh, low fish production uh, continues. So working with the chiefs, uh, we confiscated all those um, uh, illegal gears and, um, and, 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 and then set them uh, uh, on fire. I sent this picture to the principal secretary for the Minister of Health, who is my colleague, and uh, he said, I'll keep this picture just in my mailbox. I don't want to, to discourage people that are helping us out, but these are some of uh, the challenges that you get. I did mention that uh, lecturer has uh, a lot of um, beds that uh, go there for nesting, nesting from Europe, from Africa, and within the lake. And people uh, actually trap these beds for food, but also for uh, uh, for, 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 for cash. Um, so we were worried that with the repeated drying of the lake means there's not enough fish. With the floods and the droughts, the cropping situation is uh, also precarious and therefore people are finding alternatives and they might uh, uh, harvest and sustainably. And so beds are some of those. And because it is the Ramza site, Malawi has an agreement uh, with the international community that they will make sure that uh, uh, the beds are properly managed. So we developed a system of uh, MOMS, which is management oriented um, uh, management system. And the uh, communities have been trained to actually record the beds that they uh, spot, the filler form daily and the form weekly, and then you collect uh, uh, in a month. Um, so, our worry is loss of wetland ecosystems from overexploitation and unsustainable use of trying to cope with the climate change impacts. So, a vicious cycle uh, is, 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 is created. So, if you look at the period late 1960 to 2000, the wetland has shrunk because now people are growing the rice that I showed earlier. Uh, but there's also uh, loss of suitable uh, breeding uh, refugee sites for both the fish and the beds. And um, just to tell you why this was, uh, uh, it's a center of high biodiversity, actually 41 species of birds that come from Europe and 14 species from Africa. And, um, but we notice from the MOMS studies that the bird species have reduced from 164 to 108. So there's actually a need for uh, management, proper management of the beds. But we know that the pressure for the beds is coming from the impact of uh, uh, climate change. But also we took um, a picture of the island in the water in 1991, and you can see uh, in 2018. This has come about Again, because when the lake dried, not enough fish, then they are cutting the trees, making uh, charcoal. And uh, so you can see it becoming uh, there. Um, we also have uh, other ways of um, supporting communities. And uh, we have a project with the University of Glasgow, and that is uh, to produce the synthetic gas from uh, uh, rice uh, 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 crop residue, because there's quite a lot of it. Uh, you see mountains and mountains. And with the, the school feeding program, if you look in the middle, you will see that the hills where the 
uh, vegetation was is completely bare because they have been cut for uh, cooking. And the women that were cooking the school meals were struggling to find uh, energy. And um, so under the funding from uh, the uh, Scottish government, uh, we were able to design uh, a cooker, a modern cooker, that converts the biomass into synthetic uh, gas. And that's the one that they are using for uh, cooking uh, uh, on the left. Um, this is one of our success stories, uh, reversing the previous pictures that I showed of uh, good cover to less cover. This one is from less cover to good cover. And this was initiated by the communities themselves. They got tired of being flooded out every season. And uh, then they came to my office and said, what can we do? I said, plant trees. And um, they said, okay. So they planted trees. And, and then you can see within the, uh, a few years, uh, the cover has, uh, has, has happened. But then those who didn't want this type of land use, uh, uh, they were making bricks, they were building houses there. They are saying, oh, now you have introduced the snakes that were not there before. You are also criminals who be hiding in there. So there's actually need to manage uh, perceptions on ecosystem uh, this service. Uh, eutrophication, because this is a lake without uh, an outlet, so all the fertilizers and the, and, and the manure nutrients go into the lake. And um, so in 2012-2013, we had serious eutrophication. Now the eutrophication uh, creates an opportunity for the cholera gems to actually multiply very easily. And so we had um, a dry season cholera outbreak, because normally in Malawi, cholera outbreak is during the rainy season, but this time it happened during the dry season. Now what happened is that it was only those people that stay on those floating islands that uh, got the cholera. When we asked them, you know, where do they get the water for drinking? They said they get it from the front uh, of the floating hut. And when we said, where's your uh, toilet? They said behind the hut. Um, so you can understand then why the conditions um, uh, for cholera outbreaks happened. Um, in Malawi, people eat locusts. And um, so our radio listeners clubs, they said they had done a program uh, because they said that in the first week they were harvesting um, one bucket of um, locusts. In the second week, uh, it was 10. In the third week, it was 30 buckets. So they said, as much as we like the red locust, could this be a problem? And um, so I talked to my colleague at the FAO, and he came with the Minister of Agriculture, and they did the assessment, and they said, this is actually a serious outbreak in the making because the alternate drying and wetting of the uh, wetland creates uh, suitable conditions for the uh, red locust. And it, Lake Chirwa is a hot spot for the region. So if indeed this was not arrested, it means that the locust would have migrated to Zambia, to Mozambique, to uh, to, to, to Tanzania. So we're happy that uh, training the communities to be observant helped to provide us uh, an early warning system. And because of that, uh, the international lead, lead locust center in Zambia actually came to do uh, the spraying. But they had problems because uh, they need to know the humidity, the wind speed, and the equipment that Paul and Ian gave us, we hadn't put it very close uh, to where the lead locusts uh, uh, were. Uh, and so that's uh, an indication that uh, we need to follow the WMO uh, guidelines of uh, increasing the density of um, uh, monitoring uh, equipment. 
So, way forward and concluding remarks, so we have to enhance and accelerate climate action to enable social, economic and ecological systems to successfully deal with the, uh, the change. Expand and improve weather and water monitoring uh, to inform anticipatory action and better climate information services. The sheer scale of some extreme climate events require more systemic transformative action beyond incremental adaptation that we are doing uh, most of the time uh, by addressing vulnerabilities that make climate change impact worse. Because of the dynamic nature of climate change shown by increasing frequency and intensity uh, of extreme weather, Building resilience will require new skills and tools to drive a positive outcomes from the interaction of livelihood capitals. These are natural, social, and financial. And I'm also saying this requires the cross sectoral and interdisciplinary partnerships. The type University of Dundee is co creating with. Uh, partners in Africa and beyond. So I remain hopeful that the trees of hope that we planted today will help us to move forward and through these partnerships be able to address these seemingly elusive challenges of climate change for rural communities. Thank you for your attention. Stay with us, I'm afraid we're going, if you can manage, we'll let you draw breath, but maybe 10 minutes of questions. You have given us a masterclass in research impact and interdisciplinary education and in transforming lives. So we, we are grateful. Colleagues, we've got about 10 minutes. Uh, can I invite uh, any questions? Uh, why don't I start with Morris halfway through, then I'll come to Blair. Morris. Thanks a lot. The mic. Hey, thank you. So, given what you said with regards to climate change and volatility of climate, I'm wondering to what extent there is attention to to uh, cooperatives in agriculture and cooperatives in credit to help to create ownership by farmers. To address the problem, such as common pool problems, uh, failure in the, in the commons, ex negative externalities, and things like that. So I'm just wondering, the, the, it's basically the, the political area, the institutional area. So can you explain what's happening in Malawi with regards to that? Do we have, is it dominated by the private sector? Do you have farmer ownership, community ownership with regards to farms, uh, suppliers, knowledge transfer, and, and banking? Thank you. I'm going to take a round of questions, which will give you time. So, Blair, over to over to you. Here, have my thanks, Sustin. Fantastic talk. Um, my question is really about relative impact of climate change and um, intensification of agriculture on the water basin that you've been studying, and trying to understand relative contribution of each. Uh, I'd be really interested to hear what in impact each has had. If you could explain, please. Thank you. So I'm going to keep at it and just take all the questions, then you can do it in, a, in, in one round. Sarah. Thank you. That was an inspiring talk. I just wonder, following on from Blair's question, what do you think is the most important thing to do in terms of managing the water resource? Because Clearly, if the lake level drops and you're taking more for irrigation and demand for water is rising everywhere. So is there something in particular that, that would help there? There we are. I'm going to take everybody because we're so short of, of time. I would love to hear from some of our students or some of our African colleagues in the room. But while they're thinking, I'm going to take this gentleman down the front and then I'll come to 
two colleagues at the back. So here, let me you do that side up. Thank you again um, uh, for that wonderful talk and overview. My question is around the role of both um, trees, because we were planting the tree of hope today in the garden, but trees around managing the catchment, but also to provide a perennial cover in the landscape, moving away from annual crops, which to be underpinning some of that agricultural intensity. Um, my question is with respect to funding. Uh, what's the role of uh, the international bodies with respect to um, assisting Malawi in terms of funding to um, help with uh, all the need to uh, ensure what has come back? Funding with international bodies. And thank you, Professor Sustan, for a um, very enlightening presentation. Um, my question is in line with the question my colleague um, just asked. Um, the UN Secretary General talks about funding for loss and damage. I'll try to wrap this up. I'm just wondering if you have a view about whether existing uh, frameworks for funding for loss and damage, um, if you have a take on that, what, what would you say um, should happen in that direction. Thank you. Great. I'm going to take one final question, and that's us done because I realise people have have um, engagements and things to go to. We'll come back to Sawston. Probably gives you about a minute per question, and then we'll come to the principal to wind up. But can I uh, invite the lady at the back to offer the last question? Thank you for your pre um, presentation, Prof. Uh, my question basically is on the issue of gender and climate change. I mean, studies have shown that in developing nations that um, women uh, face the vulnerabilities of climate change more keener than um, men. And one of the issues is in the terms of dissemination of information. How is this um, situation being addressed in Malawi? Thank you. Having to work for your supper this evening, I'm afraid. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, I think it's working. Yeah, so the first question uh, was uh, related to issues of um, uh, addressing the, 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 the commons. And um, it is a big problem. We have tried to, like for the lake, uh, to come up with the, uh, what they call beach village committees uh, so that uh, the locals are involved in in, in governance uh, for forestry they have similar committees uh, but uh, when the pressures uh, from poor crop production are that serious uh, these um, social values that used to uh, enhance management of natural resources tended to, to, to break down. In fact, the picture showed where the uh, women are using uh, crop residue uh, for syn gas. Uh, I forgot to mention that uh, what looked like uh, mature trees, that one is because it is a, uh, a graveyard, a cemetery. And um, because they values and bylaws for cemeteries are still respected uh, uh, in the country. You can't uh, cut a tree in, in, in a cemetery, uh, but in the forest, all those bylaws have broken down. So it is a challenge and we have to find ways of uh, uh, dealing with that. Relative uh, contribution of um, climate change, that's a very good uh, question. Um, actually, if we take uh, the lecture itself, it has dried um, more than 10 times in the last uh, 100 years. Um, but according to literature, uh, the drying cycles were 25 to 40 years. So it must have been something else at play. But if you look at the drying now, it's every three to four years. And so it's definitely a contribution of serious environmental degradation, 
plus uh, uh, plus climate change, and 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 so we have to deal with both the climate change as well as uh, ensuring that um, the ecosystem integrity of the catchments is, is improved. Actually, when the, the dam dried in 1992 for supplying water to Zomba, um, what the engineers realized is that uh, water was still coming from the wetlands, but it was disappearing in the cracks of the dam. So what they did was to uh, uh, join pipes straight to the wetland by passing the dry uh, cracked mud bottom straight to the intake. And um, so I've always used that plan, uh, that example, that uh, the physical infrastructure uh, can help installing water, but they can't store water permanently, while the uh, wetlands and trees are better uh, green uh, dams. Um, most important thing to manage uh, the water resource, I uh, think they have formed the uh, water users associations, uh, but then there hasn't been upstream and downstream collaboration, which means if you have a water use association downstream, uh, other people are cutting trees upstream, uh, then you haven't achieved anything. So there's actually a need to reconstitute uh, the management uh, structure. Um, trees, uh, management for vegetation cover. Um, actually, in one study that, in, in one site on the Zomba Plateau, we dug sedimentation pits. And um, the first year we planted the trees, the sedimentation pits were full of silt. So we asked the communities, let's scoop uh, the soil. How many buckets of soil have you uh, scooped? That's 10 years ago. We invited them this year. They couldn't even fill a single bucket. So it explains to them that if you have good vegetation cover, it reduces soil erosion, but it also allows water to go down and recharge the aquifers. And I think that's what we need to do. Uh, in terms of funding, uh, quite a number of organizations have been funding uh, climate change programs. Uh, so the uh, project that we did uh, from 2010 to 2017 uh, was funded by the uh, Norwegian Embassy. And then, of course, the equipment that I mentioned uh, for monitoring uh, came from the ESPA uh, project. And um, so there are a number of uh, 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 players that are providing funding. But usually the funding comes to an end. And uh, then uh, sometimes you move to another site. And this is where I think we should have um, programs with continuity. Otherwise, the gains that you make uh, get lost if there is no uh, continuity. Um, the UN Secretary General uh, loss and damage, that's something that uh, uh, we are looking forward that uh, perhaps there is going to be uh, funding identified uh, for loss and damage, commitments made, but more importantly, there should be implementation arrangements that have less uh, bureaucracy and bottlenecks because some of the funding that uh, uh, is available, it can take you four to five years to go through the application uh, process. And, and that's too long. Uh, the problem will have become uh, worse. In terms of gender and uh, climate change, I was involved in the drafting of the uh, national climate change policy and uh, in Malawi. And so we included uh, a section uh, on gender, but we also included uh, a section uh, on family planning and reproductive health. Because uh, what we have noticed uh, is that, like Cyclone um, Anna, uh, when it came, um, it actually disrupted uh, several hospitals and uh, women that had decided they were going to uh, go into voluntary family planning uh, 
uh, actually couldn't access uh, the, the services. And our take on this is that um, if women have to be involved in uh, adaptation, uh, then, and they've made a choice that they want to space uh, the, 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 the children, uh, then they should have the services. Otherwise, if they have child after child after child within a short time, uh, then it becomes a problem in uh, getting involved in, 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 in uh, uh, adaptation. So we consider family planning and reproductive health as a strategy for empowering women and youth in uh, climate change uh, adaptation. Thank you very much. I think that was the last question. You're not free yet. You're not free yet. You're not free yet. Sosten, um, Wendy made the comment, masterclass. And there has been a masterclass, but actually you and yourself are a masterclass. I mean, colleagues will see the banners behind us uh, celebrating the, here it's a Scotland-Malawi partnership and Malawi is a Malawi-Scotland partnership. It's a very special partnership. And that people-to-people -people principle is so key. It's so key for us here today and we're celebrating that and it's so key also the long-term issue but also working with people with communities to make the change so you've given us a true true masterclass we have a very small gift for you uh just to uh remember the occasion in scotland but perhaps i can invite the audience to express their admiration and thanks to Sosten Jota.